You're listening to Adam's Motion and the Void. I was sick to death of myself, sick of my self-critical, bone-wearying in imperious ways. Every evening, while emptying a bottle of gin, I primed a list of tasks for myself to do the following day, a nasty, always-increasing roster of duties and chores that included biting hurtful asides, straighten out banking matter, if you don't do this, you are an ass, Sherwin. Or, wash breakfast dishes, Sherwin. Don't be lazy. As though I wasn't capable of washing them unless doused with shame. I had always washed my dishes after their use without a thought. And the banking matter was trifling, and had only just surfaced. And yet, there I was, striking the back of my own head with a newly sharpened shovel. I wrote my lists as to some enjoyably detested sidekick from the perspective of some all-knowing, all-powerful czar. Yet the following morning, grainy and breath-choked with hangover, I trembled over my list with the dusty, fallen spirit of the broken-hearted. I alternated between these guises, judge and victim, as morning went to night. The Tsar judge was getting stronger, and the sidekick victim weaker. Yet somehow, for this very reason, both were losing ground. I sided with the judge, if only because he seemed strong. If I could get myself in order, I thought, put myself on the right path, then I might later deal with the shrewness of my tone. It was my disarray, my slovenly personality, that was the real problem. Once I was strong, solid, real even, once I came under control, I would address the moodiness of my self-talking. So, I let the talk inside me intensify and accelerate, as though sending myself off to boot camp to be beaten into submission. My lists cascaded to several sheets, my rules and laws grew stronger, stricter. Do not laugh in mixed company. Do not speak unless first spoken to. Have a firm handshake. Remember everyone's name. Do not be late for appointments. Do not frivolously spend. Get enough sleep. Do not overeat. No more cookies. My drinking stepped up as to cover it all, until the demands I was putting on myself and the destructiveness of my messaging began to box me in and tie me down as the laws and rules I was creating began to cross-violate one another and toward a paralytic state, I descended. Sit down, stand up, sit down. Not like that, like this, not like this, like that. You have two cups today, you have one tomorrow. If you sleep nine hours today, you'll sleep six tomorrow. 
I am the very model of a modern major general. I've information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England. I can quote the face historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I'm very well acquainted too with matters mathematical. I understand equations both simple and quadratical. About binomial theorem, I am teeming with a lot of news. Yeah, oh, a lot of news, a lot of news. Ah. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. I'm very good at integral and differential calculus. I know the scientific names of beings and amount of the sort of magic. It was the middle 1970s, and I was stuck in an endless run of the droll foxes at the Icelandic Afia Palisades Theater in Houston, Texas. The droll foxes was a standard family farce in two clumsy acts that presented the well-to-do, but always in a flurry, foxes. It is the sort of play in which the main characters are always dressed in out-of-date formal wear, as though ballroom gowns and tuxedos were perfectly good things to wear to bed. The play moved swiftly around its principal setting of the Fox family estate of Cansettle Court. A patriarchal family, the Foxes were domineered, micromanaged, verbally pulverized, and otherwise pampered and spoilt by Maxwell Fox, played by myself, a narcissist who ran hot and cold, Max Fox stepped between cruelty and kindness as from left foot to right, alternately screaming fresh murder at his family, or then suddenly shifting into the pose of a regretful king, handing out little gumdrops or presents, jewelry or cash. Max was a newspaper magnate who liked to follow the idea that he was very nearly in control of the entire planet. He was friends with the president and sent memos to the prime minister. He received Christmas gifts from His Holiness the Pope and sent books to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Max Fox had his hand in the pocket of the world and he could see his own sharp effect play out every day in affairs of state. Look here, the play begins. Maxwell slaps his newspaper and storms across the living room to his bonbon snacking wife, Pumpkin. The damn Etruscan spelled my name wrong. Max shouts as though all evidence has led him to her as the problematical source. Well, dear, you mustn't forget, Pumpkin purrs and pats his cheek. They are Etruscans, after all. Laughter. Max groans, checks his pocket watch, and then absent-mindedly slips a diamond ring on Pumpkin's chocolatey finger. She yawns. So this is how it goes with the foxes, the audience thinks pleased to see the rich people suffering for their finery. And so it went. Max bossed his wife, manipulated his children, threatened his colleagues, fired any infidel, and threw dirty looks at his staff, all while influencing world events via his conglomerated news organ. Yet the foxes were quite a happy and silly family, at least when father wasn't around. The moment he went off to work, Out came the cakes and funny hats. The whole lot would giggle and laugh and jamble away at the piano and sing, and the entire living room would be redecorated with ribbons and confetti would be thrown and all the lights would come on and string hung from the stairs and birds would fly around and the servants would plop down on the couches and settees, undo their stays, loosen their ties and be treated like friends. 
and sometimes Pumpkin herself would go and fetch them all cucumber sandwiches, servants too. And then at four o'clock or so, one of the girls would call out, Oh no, it's him! And everyone would scatter to that task, turning the living room back into its grim Victorian tomb, with every bit of whimsy tucked back into hiding, just as awful Maxwell Fox stepped in. And of course, one offending item, usually a feather or a fluffy boa, would remain conspicuously dangling from the chandelier, which Max would spy with uncanny swiftness. What's that infuriating object there? Max would point with all mountable drama, as though a stick of dynamite were about to explode near a baby. That's just a feather, Daddy, one of the girls would say, and grab it. Destroy it forthwith, Max shouts, one of his special, never quite appropriate to the occasion phrases. I will not see feathers in places. I wish to be perfectly clear, he harumphs. At any rate, I went from my increasingly paralyzing private scorn at home to a more public, albeit theatrical, version in which I indulgently hectored and tortured everyone around me with greatest contumely. Except in the play, there was one character I could not ill-treat, no matter how hard I tried. A little retarded gardener known as Lumpy. Lumpy refused, gently but firmly, in his uncooked vegetable voice, to obey me. Whenever Max tells Lumpy to mow the lawn or stop watering a tree, he simply replies, The card doesn't say so, by which he means his employment card which he keeps in his back pocket. This was a notarized legal document that Max had signed that outlined Lumpy's duty on the estate. Lumpy's job, the card said, was to keep the grounds neat and tidy to the best of his ability and in his own fashion as he saw fit. According to the card, stiff penalties would be served if the covenant with Lumpy were violated. At any rate, Max views Lumpy initially as a pest but this grows in exponential charging until Lumpy has become Max's chief arch-enemy on the planet Earth. Max begins to spend less and less time at the office controlling world leaders and more and more time trying to bring Lumpy to the lamppost, as Max called it, by which he referred to a prized black rose, his black beauty, planted at the base of the garden lamppost, a flower Lumpy purely refused to court, care for, or acknowledge. You will water black beauty, Max shouts in a penultimate exchange. The card doesn't say so, Lumpy replies. The card doesn't have to say so. I say so. If you don't water my roads, Lumpy, you aren't watering me. The card doesn't say that I have to do what you say. Just what the garden says, Lumpy replies. What the garden says? Of all the... Yes, Lumpy said. And what is the garden saying, pray? Leave me alone, Lumpy said. And the grass? Walk on me. Not cut me, not rake me. Maybe tomorrow the grass says that. And the trees, I'm sure they're speaking in epigrams. Aren't we pretty and tall, they say. To which I say yes, don't you? Oh, yes, quite pretty and tall, but I wonder, dear Lumpy, what does my black rose say? Doesn't it speak, too, of its wants, desires? Yes, Lumpy answers. It says, let me die, please let me die. At which point Max grabs Lumpy's lips and pinches them shut and slowly manhandles him through the gates of Cansettle Court with the final words, Never return, you rose-killing disaster! The reviewers were not kind to the droll foxes. Never funny, never clever, went one headline. Exceeding poppycock, ran another. I was not much attached to the play as a means of generating any self-value, so I failed to follow these with interest. I only cared that the play itself would not die. The theatre was packed and boiling with happy laughter, Thursday through Sunday, and there was deep pleasure vibrating the hearts of the audience as Maxwell Fox got his comeuppance in the form of Lumpy being awarded ownership 
of Cansettle Court due to Max's lip-squeezing and vicious banishment, which violated the strictures of the employment card. I will see you and that damned card in hell, Max screams his final line, about to be hauled off to the ironically named Black Rose Prison, to which, of course, Lumpy shines the card a final time and says, but now with a knowing smile, it doesn't say so on the card. As the door shuts on Maxwell Fox, Lumpy announces that the family can of course stay with him at Cansuttle Court as long as they like. Balloons fall from the ceiling. Chickens run from closets as Pumpkin and her daughters gather around Lumpy. And it is implied that life will now be completely exploded into a thing of laughter, wild birds, cake, and festivities. I would go straight away to my dressing room and drop a full half-pint of gin into my gullet as though depositing a stone in a waste bucket. And then another half-pint as I began to burnish my judge's gavel before heading home to write myself a little note. Fox in the snow Where do you go to find something you could eat? Cause the word out on the street is you are starving Don't let yourself go hungry now Don't let yourself go cold Fox in the snow Where do you go to find someone who will do To tell someone all the truth before it kills you Listen to your crazy laugh Before you hang a ride And disappear from sight What do they know anyway? You read it in a book What do they know? Read it in a book tonight Boy on the bike What do you like As you cycle round the town You're going up You're going down You're going nowhere It's not as if they're pain as if it's fun At least not anymore When your legs are black and blue It's time to take a break When your legs are black and blue It's time to take a holiday Summing up, nasty to self at home, 
nasty to others at work. A strange case of the enormous furies. It seems in retrospect hard to believe that a man can burn so fiercely and brightly and unrelentingly both outside and in. But I managed. That is until one evening when I realized that the drill sergeant voice had stopped, perhaps due to the amount of gin I'd had, and that I was hardly there at all, just shaking in the grim grip of drunkenness. Perhaps I am dying, I thought at the time. Perhaps this feeling of absence is the body undergrown with the moss of coming death. There was just blankness in me, a cold, painful blankness. And to put something on the blankness, I found myself uttering a wish I'd had earlier that day in my dressing room after the play, when I realized I'd rather be lumpy inheriting the estate than Maxwell Fox in prison and I whispered that to have something at least to hold on to as I perished. I wish I was lumpy. I wish I was lumpy, just doing the gardening when the gardening spoke up, watering the flowers when they asked for it, trimming the bushes when they said trim, admiring the trees, letting the black rose die, letting it die. And then this phrase entered me. It penetrated, and I woke, however absolutely still, to full alertness. No longer even drunk, it seemed. My body felt numb and useless, a cold rubber suit around me. But my awareness was there in full, absorbed in this important shift. Let the black rose die. It wants to die. And I felt in myself the hunger of that cancerous darkness that had spread so swiftly within me. It wasn't me that wanted to die, but it. The feeling itself wished for death. It was unto itself and entire, and strange as it was, absolutely separate from me, like a poison introduced or a parasite, that I had been hijacked by my own black rose, that it had held itself before my inner eye for so long, that I had forgotten I was the seeing, not the thing seen, and that I could let it die, simply by remembering this. It was as though I were to confuse myself with being Maxwell Fox. I was suddenly remembering. I am just playing a part. An area of great quiet came through me, into which emerged some intimate, infinitely small, yet vast sense of open witness. I was the wide blue sky, a bystander to all that passed. The spacious, emptying feeling reverberated in me all that night, and the following morning, as I lay in bed, I realized I could not rise at my own volition. There was no one there ordering me from bed. If the world wanted me to get up, I would, but otherwise, this suited me just fine. It was the world, I realized, that moved around me, not me around the world. No matter how tricky the concept, or how in control I once felt. As I was to Maxwell Fox, so the world was to me. I was a puppet on the hand of creation. As the morning went on, I felt as though a ton of bricks had been lifted from my body. There was relief in this, but a strange and foreign pain as well, an electric, a deep pain, as though in relieving my body of the burden the body was finally able to sense and name the damage. There is injury here, and here, and here, my body reported. Pain in this circumstance comes, I learned, with withdrawal rather than penetration. I was a broken man, 
but it was revealed at last, and I lay in the revelation, healing already. Dear sir, I write this note to you to tell you of my plight, for at the time of writing it, I'm not a pretty sight. My body is all black and blue, my face a deathly grey, and I write this note to say why I am not at work today. While working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear, but tossing them down from such a height was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't very pleased, he is an awkward sod, and he said I had to cart them down the ladders in me hod. Well, clearing all these bricks by hand, it was so very slow. So I hoisted up a barrel and secured a rope below. But in me haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. <laughs> and so when I untied the rope, the barrel fell like lead. And clinging tightly to the rope, I started up instead. I shot up like a rocket, and to my dismay I found that halfway up I met the bloody barrel coming down. Well, the barrel broke me shoulder as to the ground it sped. And when I reached the top, I banged the pulley with me head. But I clung on tightly, numb with shock from this almighty blow. While the barrel spilled out half its bricks some 14 floors below. Now when these bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor, I then outweighed the barrel and so started down once more. But I clung on tightly to the rope, me body racked with pain. And halfway down I met the bloody barrel once again. <clears throat> the force of this collision halfway down the office block caused multiple abrasions and a nasty case of shock. But I clung on tightly to the rope as I fell towards the ground and I landed on the broken bricks the barrel had scattered round. Well, as I lay there on the floor, I thought I'd pass the worst, but the barrel hit the pulley wheel, and then the bottom burst. A shower of bricks rained down on me, I didn't have a hope. As I lay there bleeding on the ground, I let go the bloody rope. <laughs> the barrel now being heavier, it started down once more. It landed right across me as I lay there on the floor. It broke three ribs in my left arm, and I can only say, I hope you'll understand why I am not at work today. Eventually, as there must be, there was a knock at the door. Gerald Frame, the man portraying Lumpy, came frantically in. We're on in eight minutes, Sherwin. Everyone's going crazy. Gerald helped me out of bed, and we went rushing down the street. The theatre was close enough, but I still needed to get into costume. In my dressing room, I stood like a child as my bedclothes were torn off and my Maxwell Fox tuxedo shoved on. I stood for a momentary blush and smear of makeup. Oil and a comb would run through my hair, and I was handed my newspaper prop and pushed onto stage where I heard myself say, Look here, the damn Etruscan spelled my name wrong. The play ended, 
I went back to my dressing room. I didn't change, but sat in Max's tuxedo. I wasn't doing anything, but, like Lumpy, I was contentedly waiting for the world to call to me. At some point later, the theater's houseman entered to clean up. Time to leave, sir, he said, and I stood up, exited the theater. I stood outside in much the same fashion. My legs felt light and my spine loose. I was content just to breathe, just to watch the passers-by, to feel the breeze of the darkening city. Shortly, a fine misting rain began to fall. It warmed me at first, tickled my neck, and I felt comforted, caressed. But soon I found myself getting cold. I was hungry, too. I needed to eat, to get warm. I was walking down the street, heading home. I ate a sandwich at the kitchen table while the bath water ran, and then I lay in the warm embrace of the water until the water began to cool, and I felt how tired I was. I got into bed, fell asleep. The next morning the phone rang. I answered it. The play's director demanded I explain my previous day's tardiness. The only answer I had was enigmatic. I could not, in any practical way, explain myself. I have brought Lumpy to the lamppost, I said. Don't let it happen again, he snapped and hung up. I won't, I said. When the play finally did end its run, I allowed myself to keep a souvenir, the prop of Lumpy's card, and every now and then I take it out and speak the line, as though reminding myself where and how, in the great mysterious space of being, the intimacy of the uttermost self most closely and lovingly watches. Adams, Motion, and the Void. <laughs>